Hello and welcome to my Retro Watches, the channel, it's the home of the affordable hobbyist watchmaking. And what have we got in front of us today? Well, it's quite an iconic watch. You may know this watch, or may you may not. It is a very small watch, it's only 30 millimeters in diameter. Uh, this is an A11, it's actually a Bulova A11, and these were issued during the Second World War by the American military. They put out a request to make a watch that had to be reliable, had to be uh, 15 joules, had to have hacking, which was the most important feature, had to be very legible, and had to have this 10 minute increment scale on the dial. All important for timing um, military campaigns. They'd get a lot of guys, all the soldiers in one room, and they would shout hack, and everyone would set their watches and obviously push the crown in simultaneously to all be synchronized, because of course that is critical in battle. Um, and this one looks like it's seen uh, a battle. However, it hasn't. Uh, the true ones on the back here will have military numbers and stamps on them, uh, their issue numbers and such like. And sadly, this one hasn't, but it certainly looks like it's been through the ringer, that's for certain. So it is a brass or a brass alloy type of case, nickel plating, I think some of them are silver. Um, but yeah, quite an iconic piece in many respects and I'm pleased to have this on my bench. I bought it actually last year and uh, I did a video of uh, an unboxing of eight vintage watches and this was the main prize in that box and the reason I bought all of them. And it's only now that I get round to trying to repair it and see all the good stuff inside. So you can see uh, it's, well obviously it's seen better days. Uh, if you look, if I try and angle it, the camera goes a bit blurry. I'm on a microscope here. The second hand is, uh, well, very, very bent. And there's another frustrating problem. And that is, I mean, look at the crown. Look how much action that's seen. You pull the crown out and I cannot turn any of the hands at all. It just wobbles. Uh, so that is an issue and an issue that I need to try and solve. It's a little bit of a worry because that could indicate a jam or could indicate a bit of rust. So if this is a watch you want to see repaired, stick around because we're going to crack open the back and have a look starting right now. And the back is off. Here is the main case back and there's a few service marks on there. Sorry about the dazzle. It doesn't like the gold, this particular microscope I'm using today. Actually a new microscope from Link Micro uh, in on trial to see if it uh, is any better. It records in 4K, genuine 4K. And if I get on with it, certainly in this video, um, then I will be doing a review for them and for you guys because we do need microscopes in our lives in this hobby. Excuse the crudeness of how to get under this gasket, but I don't see any other way. Now, I have been in here before, but it has been quite a while. So this is, I guess, a bit of waterproofing, or certainly dustproofing, and it comes with this little cover. And I'm hoping to rodico it off, but that's, there we go. This is what this video is going to be all about. Look at that. That's a beauty. So I'm going to get the uh, movement out of the case, get it in a holder, and we'll start the disassembly. It's obviously not running at all. I don't know if there's any power in it, but we'll get onto all that good stuff in just a moment. Okay, watch this out. And uh, we've got to remove those hands. The dial looks pretty fat, fragile, and, uh, well, military used, doesn't it? I think it's great. The concern I have is normally I like to have the hands all together. That's what you want to do. You bunch them up so you can leave them off easily. And here, uh, that's not the case. Um, so I'm going to cover with a bit of plastic, turn it upside down, so I can get a good angle where I am, and just see what's going to happen. Yeah, already hitting problems. Can that second hand be moved? No, it can't. Okay.
Oh. Well, I didn't want that to happen, <laughs> but it did. But at least they are off. That's the main thing. And all in one piece, just about. Okay, we're looking now with the dial off and um, well what is surprising me here is the crown and I still can't turn it you can see it's trying to turn so far I can see all the teeth are on the wheel uh, this here that is the hacking lever that is the balance there it's quite interesting how they've developed that so it's all coming off the action of the setting lever here Come through this arm, which clearly must click and put pressure on that spring and all the rest of it. Uh, so I'm just going to bring in a microscope a little bit closer so we can have a good look at the rust and uh, then take it apart and see what's causing it. Instinct now is if it's okay on this side, then well, my instinct actually is telling me really it's the cannon pinion here that's going to be rusted on. But uh, let's just get a bit closer and have a quick look. Okay, well, this is quite impressive, actually. Like I say, I'm using this microscope for the first time. I'm still a good two inches, 50 millimeters away from the main plate. And we're getting some good imagery, aren't we, really? But yeah, I'm expecting to see trouble. Um, but this little bit of surface rust here does not uh, phase me at all. Just needs a good clean. Um, so let's just try, while we're here, this close up to get rid of the dial washer see if we can get the no nope. oh, yes here lies the problem straight away i was going to say let's see if we can get the hour wheel off i'm going to come in with some thicker tweezers and no that is well that is going to be a conundrum straight away because how do I remove that? Because without removing that, I can't really remove much on the other side, can I? Let me just focus in on the top of that. So yeah, that is a that is a bit of an, an issue, certainly for me. Just wondering if I get a bit of pegwood. Will it? Does it? Does it move at all? Oh yes, it is just very stiff, but it does it does turn. Sometimes, you know, I might be able to free it up. Does it turn on? It's, it, now it turns on the crown, look. Okay, well it's never done that. It's disengaged itself now, so the wheel must have risen up a little bit. Still not enough. Right, okay, well, let's take off what we can and what we can't, we'll leave on. So just looking at this cover plate, it seems to tuck under that. So I'm guessing that some of the hack has to come out first. It's definitely going to benefit from a good clean, this, if nothing else. So I'm kind of wishing, really, that this one had seen a little bit of action. I think it then makes it just that little bit more nostalgic, really, that you're working on something that, you know, a guy uh, served wearing in his arm you know, in battle or doing something for the war effort. It's quite hard to believe really that, you know, some of these guys, you know, would have been big chaps probably, uh, certainly brave, and they're going into battle with a watch that is like 30 odd millimetres in diameter, and today's world, you know, 
we are at 40, even 45 millimetres diameter and thinking, yeah, the bigger the watch, the bigger the man. Well, obviously that wasn't the case back then, was it? So again, this looks quite decent. That's uh, going to be unscrewed from the other side. We need to release the spring. Then we really want to get that out. Okay, right. And I think I need a, a multi-tool. Good old Roddy coat. <laughs> Even Roddy coat doesn't unstuck all that grime. Can I just get under there gently? Don't want to scratch it and leave my mark unnecessarily. Just curious if I could have got the minute wheel out, but doesn't look it. You know, I'm actually I'm going to put that that wheel back in, and I'm going to go off camera for a minute and just spend five minutes just winding the crown, and just see. You never know; it might just be enough to. If I can get the hour wheel back on. Well, being very unsuccessful, still won't budge. So I'm going to leave it in place. Just take the hacking lever out and flip the movement over. Strip as much as I can off, basically, and then try and clean it to start with. What I love is that the spring is held down by a screw. I don't know. Well, I must have seen it before, uh, but not very often. And that's great because some of these springs are an absolute pain. Also means you can potentially leave it in situ, which I will do for now. So I have a problem on my hand straight away. I have an unexploded bomb almost. If I put the screwdriver into the main spring barrel, and try and turn. It, it's stuck fast. And what I'm trying to do is wind the spring really so I can move the click down here to take any power out of the mainspring. So that's an indication that the whole movement is pretty much seized up, which, um, yeah, it's not going to be fun. So I'm going to try and strip down a little bit more, get off what we can. And again, leave on what we can't. Have this lovely little top plate here, which is holding on the centre seconds pinion and there's nowhere to lever it to get it off its two posts and under here is the pinion so I've got to be very careful normally they have, things have a little slot you know we don't know how long this has been on for Well, it's moved a little bit. I thought there were posts it was sitting on, but obviously not.
Well, I'm at a loss there. Chaps, I've just took that off. You've watched me do it. I need to watch the video back. Where is the centre seconds pivot? I could have sworn I saw it when I was uh, seeing how the part got off. It should be sitting in here. Has it dropped it? Where is it? <laughs> it had to have one. The second hand was on the watch. Oh dear. Right, okay. Have to stop the cameras and have a good look around. Well, I've had a good look around and I cannot find it at all. Uh, I've looked back at the video, didn't see it come out. I'm fearing the worst at the moment that I've broken it. But I've shook it upside down, everything. There's no part. So where is it? Maybe it didn't have one after all, but I just, that second hand was stuck fast. So it's gonna, again, going to carry on. This is turning into a disaster. Right, I need to remove the third wheel here which is kind of pushed on to this place at the top. You need a special tool, really. It's a Presto type tool. These are the, these are the Presto types. Sorry, I need to be much further out with the magnification, really. But it has a special end. So you can see for focus, has some claws, and they get round the spokes, basically, and you can pull it off that way. I was lucky, this is a version one, found it at a watch fair for five UK pounds. These are usually well, a lot more expensive than that. So we wrap it round the spokes, in theory. Just trying to get my fingers out of the way so you can see it on film. And there we are, nice and easy. Right, with that wheel out of the way, I'm going to bring this microscope down and have a look at all the dirt and grime that is on this plate. That's the pivot and jewel of the wheel we just took off. This is the spring. It should be holding the pinion. It's missing. Balance looks okay. Pretty dirty everywhere. If we try and look down into the bottom. Yeah, lots of dirt and grime nice timing screws all the way around the balance love this it's got its own little separate bridge for the escape and if anyone does this as a hobby they know usually when you put in train wheel bridges on it's the escape that causes the grief this one has its own which makes it a lot easier and in general it's just a little bit beaten isn't it and of course we have Overwatch Company USA 10 AK. Now there's another number under there 15 or 16 joules. Sorry, there we go. All right, let's strip it down. Chance in my arm a little bit here. But if the ratchet wheel comes off, then there's a good chance there's no power in that mainspring. Everything is just so stuck on, that's the problem. You're going to have to remove the click. So, with that off, we can assume that there's no power. Normally it would have unraveled if there was. Equally, it could still be just that it's jammed up. So, anticipation of taking the bridge off and we'll keep we'll, we'll keep going all the same just try and get the click spring out Yeah. 
Here's me thinking this is a different bridge. It's not, it's actually joined. Just gives you that illusion. Oh well. <laughs> Once again, just needs a bit of persuasion to get off its posts. I don't think this one's been apart for quite a long time. Still concerns me, where is that pivot, <laughs> that pinion and wheel? It's not here, is it? Why am I going mad completely? I don't know. I can't be going mad. So of course this is attached to the can opinion on the other side which is rusted on. Or seized on. But everything feels seized. All these wheels feel seized. I wanted to get out as much as I could. My missing screw. We can get out the escape. see that the barrel is coming with me might make things a bit tricky no just about get it out right so I'm concerned about obviously where that pinion is setting lever doesn't want to come out either so it's going to show a lot about the cleaning in this video but to start with I'm just going to put that in a bit of degreaser uh, or no, actually some old or uh, cleaning fluids and stick it in the ultrasonic. See if we can loosen those wheels up. Well, luckily enough, the three parts came out before I soaked them. I uh, went straight off camera and tried to just pull the hour wheel here and eventually it came off and you can see all the dirt. If we sort of turn this wheel to one side, I'm blocking the light our night typically. Yeah, you can see look, it's all grimy. It's not actually rust from what I can tell. Again, if you just look at the uh, cannon pinion there. It looks rough, but I think these will clean up fine. Same with the hour, hour wheel inside the hole there. So the plan will be still to soak these. Um, that's the most obvious thing for me to do along with all of the other parts. So I wanted to show a little bit about cleaning, but this is pretty much an extreme example of a dirty watch. So parts like this are gonna go in a little basket. I'm gonna put them in some cleaning fluid that I use in my watch cleaning machine, but some old fluid basically, and soak them in there, put them in the ultrasonic on a hot wash of 40 degrees Celsius, along with many of the other parts. So let's just get set up show you a little bit about pegging out and all the rest. So here is the main plate. Here's a bit of pegwood that I've sharpened on my sanding machine. And I'm just literally going to go around the jewels. Just going to try and give you an example here. Get them in the center a little bit. Just turn it like so. There's an argument to cut this 
into a sort of square at the end. Look, that's got stuck in there already, but we'll get that out. Um, because being a square will clean it better. I just find it just needs a gentle clean. This is going to go through so many different cycles um, that it's almost academic, but it just helps to break down some of the old, and it is old, grease. Where it's going to need a helping hand, of course, is places like this. Where I'm going to get a different piece of wood for that. Where this is all really, really baked on. The more pre-cleaning pre I do, the better it will be, uh, or the more it will save my cleaning fluids in the main machine, because they are, as I've probably said before in other videos, very expensive. So I'm going to have to go round the whole plate here, especially here, look, see, just give it all a good clean. I'm just doing it for demonstration purposes at the minute, but I will do it much better than this. Get into places like that and give it a helping hand. Um, so that will be done for the main plates. The parts themselves, we're just going to literally, here's some cleaning fluid. We're going to put them in a basket and drop them in that and hope for the best. And then after I've done the first cycle of cleaning, I'm going to clean the pivots um, on the wheels with a pivot cleaner or pivot polisher, should I say. And then we should be good to go. So I'm just going to load all the baskets up and clean the rest of this for your enjoyment. A little bit of a tip if you're doing this, don't put a lid on your basket and then you can use your tweezers to get it out of these little jars really easily. And look what I found. I think it must have got stuck to my clothing. It was at least six foot away from my desk. It was a lucky find. And I can see that the top pivot here where the second hand sits is bent. And I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with this at the moment, whether I can get a replacement I may try and risk and use it, uh, all part of the charm. Hopefully, if it doesn't foul on something, then in theory it could still rotate and take the second hand with it. Uh, but anyway, a lucky escape just to find the part. This thing is absolutely tiny. Uh, here's a reference, here's a battery. <laughs> so yes, nice and small, but I'm relieved to have found that part. So main plate and everything's had one clean so far uh, in the ultrasonic and then around in the watch cleaning machine and you can see it's come up really nicely actually the jewels are all clean you can see the brass uh, coming under the plating here uh, but that's great I mean this thing is 80 something years old and I think that's pretty reasonable it's got rid of all the grime excuse my fingers but we are going to clean it again just to be sure just turn it over you can again see the other side where all the grime was over here so it's lifted off just about everything and i think that's mainly done from the heat wash to be honest with you i think it softens all that old grime and everything else so that's a bit of a win so these are the main wheels that were stuck on you remember the cannon pinion and again you can see now that's looking pretty reasonable and same with this one I try and focus so you can just see it's still got a few little marks on there discoloration which we're going to address in just a moment and then that is the hour wheel which I thought looked terrible and now I think it looks pretty good so plan is to use a thing called a pin polisher so this is a pin polisher or a pivot polisher you can get these from cousins they're really cheap and it's not as good as a j cut tool by any stretch but you can buy these different bits that go in the end you can see the green bit here and that's a bit like um 
the rubber on a pencil or an eraser, depending on what country you're in, with a bit of abrasive in there, buy them in different grits. And the whole idea is we are just going to push it gently into here and you're going to twist it. So we'll be able to get that all the way down. It is quite a big pivot on this. But eventually it'll go all the way down. And I'm just going to keep turning that for a few minutes. And the aim is just to polish it up a little bit and make it a bit better. It's a sort of a cheaper way to do it. But you can gain a lot of amplitude from having good clean pivots. There we go, we're nearly down the bottom now. Um, so you do run the fine line of trying to remove too much material, but trust me, with this type of abrasive, you aren't taking anything off that's noticeable, uh, but it will just make those areas just that little bit smoother. Can't see much um, improvement just yet, but it does take some time. I'm actually gonna do all the other wheels too, but that is a cheap way of doing these things, trying to show you the end here. And here I'll share with you a little tip uh, that I don't think I've shown online before. So I use a bit of black permanent marker on these acrylic crystals. And then you do a first sand with a bit of wet and dry. It shows up all of the scratches. So it gives you something to work with so you kind of know when you've got rid of them. So here I'm now using some diamond micron paste, six microns, and just reducing the scratches slowly but surely. But it's just a good way to highlight where they are uh, because often you can buff them all up like this and then realize there's still a deep one that you've actually missed three microns now we'll go through the same process all very quickly and speed it up of course and then finishing off with good old poly watch you'll see the results at the end of the video okay we're nearly ready for assembly but i need to take off the uh, balance from the cock so that I can get at this jewel because the screws for it are underneath. And usually the best way I find is to undo the screw, the little stud screw here, um, while it's on the movement. And you don't want to completely unscrew it, just enough to then potentially push the stud through. Or have it loose like so okay now I just need to remove the whole thing and we can address the oiling and the cleaning of that jaw and here we go We've got two more really really small screws to undo so with the screws out you've got there's the um, index pins and the jaw there which is looking still a little bit, can't see it in this light, a little bit dirty still look. So I'm going to give that a bit of a quick clean, put it back together, use the auto oiler through here to oil it, and then we can put the hairspring back on and assemble the watch. Right, here we go with the assembly. It always helps to have taken some photographs or a video so you know the placements of the wheels because otherwise you get yourself in a right mess. Like this one, you've got the escape, that wheel, and then this one goes over the top of the two.
some uh, D5. For the barrel. And then we can drop in the centerless, the centerless, the center wheel. Bit of D5 for the setting lever, that's the setting lever screw even. And always the tricky part is fitting the bridges. Especially when working on a microscope that you're not used to at all. So it looks like I've got some tweaking to do to get that into place. Okay, that was a little bit of a battle off camera, and it's all because that third wheel has that extra long pivot that uh, has the the other wheel on it and you have to thread that through to get it on now the barrel's not in place very well but you can see it still turns the train so that's a bit of a win a uh, bit painful at the same time um, but then that is always the hard part just a little bit of d5 for the barrel arbor Fibers get in everywhere, especially when you're filming. A bit more D5 there. Higher friction for the crown wheel. And it's a left-handed thread screw with only one slot, so it's quite deceptive. They usually have three slots in them, but whether this is an age thing, I don't know. That's sounding a heck of a lot better, apart from still seeing debris falling in everywhere. <laughs> but there we go. So, a few more things to fit uh, before we can start testing as to whether this thing is actually going to run. Putting a touch of oil on there, it's probably a bit too much actually. Not sure if it's a place I need to oil, to be honest, but um, we've still got a turning part made from metal. And where two metals meet, we get friction. And of course, this is the part that eluded me. A 
I also have my slight concerns over the spring because the spring is quite bent. Tricky part to get on and right. And with these, the pallet forks, I do tend to like to use my main scope before I push down, just to be 100% sure, because this is quite an easy place to damage your pivot on your pallet fork. So always be checking to make sure it's going to be lined up and avert a disaster. Okay, pallet fork is installed. Put a bit of wind in and look, it's moving. So I haven't ordered any of the pivots yet, but I think it's going to be time to put the balance in because that's the most exciting part, seeing it run again. Pretty confident the moment it's going to run. How well it's going to run, well, that's another story completely. Here we go then. <laughs> yes, it's going before I've even pressed it down or put the screw in. Hopefully that's in focus for you guys. I am pleased to see that. Honestly, I really am. And you know what? I think that's running pretty healthy. There we go. I can also, once again, see a bit more debris on the top there. You know, I am in my garage and it has got my uh, laundry stuff in here as well. And uh, we were running the washing machine earlier on. So this is probably the result. But talking of results, that is amazing result. Look at that. You get into this hobby, right? Seeing that go, never, ever gets boring trust me i'm filming this now i'm looking at my watch it's quarter past 12 in the morning should we say a.m and uh yeah <laughs> i can sleep a happy man tonight and that's what i'm going to do now to be honest with you i'm going to put that screw in and i'm going to let it run overnight uh before coming back putting the keyless works in because uh you know working too late in the evenings can sometimes cause problems by slipping with a screwdriver and uh, I've done all the major mistakes in my life. So there we go, uh, you will see me in just a moment and um, I wish you good night. Well, here we are about 18 hours on and the movement's on the time grapher and this is the reading you are seeing. It's uh, definitely got some beat error and that's gonna be a struggle. It's a fixed stud on this one. So I'm gonna have to take the hairspring off and give it a little tweak. Uh, but before I do that, I think I'm gonna just build all the keyless and be sure all the hacking uh, mechanism works. So there's one thing I didn't fit, and that is this drive wheel to drive the second hand's pinion. And for that, I had to remove that little cover for it as well that I'd already fitted. So that's a late night watch making for you. So this is just gonna sit on the pivot, which I can't really see from my angle. And then you're just gonna use a hand press, I guess, just to push it down. Here we are looking a bit closer up now that's fitted and you can see the wheel is slowly but surely rotating and turning the pinion there. 
nice to see it actually working. It's not fouling on the spring underneath that I can see. So safe to say I can put the little bridge on. What I never really mentioned on this watch is just, just the amount of scratches all over it. So certainly this, this bridge plate here and there is in a hell of a state. And you have to question how on earth that actually happens. You know, this thing's only got one service stamp. I mean, I guess it may have been in people's drawers over the years or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah. Not been handled very well by anyone else uh, until I've come along. <laughs> Maybe I should scratch it myself. Right, okay, I'll put that little thing on. We'll turn over, we'll do the keyless. A little bit of D5 for the cannon pinion. Same for the minute wheel pinion or wheel. winding pinion in there and I pre grease that so those two will mesh once the crown goes in a little drop of d5 for the yoke post and just a touch of grease where the yoke will sit in the clutch. A bit of grease on the end of that. It has a rather unusual setting lever spring here. It basically fits flush with that, with the uh, the setting lever itself. So the grease just needs to go there. So I've got a couple of screws to do. So in many respects, the main part of this watch, which is the hacking lever that um, made it sort of famous, I guess, or it was a necessary requirement for the, for the uh, soldiers. And of course we've got this spring to deal with. So I kind of need to move it into position like that, get a screw in and then deal with the uh, the other part afterwards. And by the looks of things it's already Hacking the movement. There we go, look. So now we've just got to fit the actuator and put a little bit of grease, I'm guessing, here where the two meet. Right, I've also just pulled the crown into time setting because I feel that's probably where it needs to be in order to fit this properly. And that just fits below there. 
So I'm going to put that last screw in. So all that remains really to say now is if you are enjoying this video, then just pause it really quickly, scroll down a bit and hit that like button. If more of you did that, my channel would grow a bit more. We can spread the word about hobbyist watchmaking. Really appreciate if you do that. That's all I like to ask my subscribers to ever do. Is like, subscribe if you want to, and of course, leave comments. And with the screw installed, here we see the hacking. You can see the balance spinning here. It's quite a good little hack, to be honest with you. It's better than some of the more modern ones that have got flimsy little springs and stuff that's very solidly made. In hindsight, I think I do need to put a little bit of grease down here where the two meet again, but it feels really smooth. Same if I try to set the time. That's nice and sweet as well. There's no tightness there. And of course, there was loads of tightness before, so we've definitely uh, achieved uh, a repair a good repair, I think. Right, now to try and see if we can adjust that beat error. Right, let's try and show you this. I'm holding everything on a bit of an angle. It's a bit tight as well. So here's my oiler, it's out of focus. But if you can see that little bar there, that's the, that's the pallet fork. And at the end of that is where it interacts with the impulse jewel on the balance. And you can kind of see it's got banking, we call them banking pins, but this is the banking pins are actually part of the um, the bridge there. That's a bit, a bit more in focus. And what you want is it to be completely uh, in the center. I really wish I could demonstrate it a bit more. And to me, it looks like the one on the right is slightly smaller gap than the one on the left. Got to be careful because I keep touching the balance with my uh, finger as well. Um, so you would assume really that we just need to move that ever so slightly to the right by moving the collet on the hairspring to swing it all around. And you're talking fractions of a millimetre almost. It's not going to be much. The only thing that throws me a little bit is, let's try and get it in focus. Actually, if I put it down like this, it might be a bit better. So you can see the jewel here. And this is the pallet fork arm. And the jewel, well, the, the, the actual design has got this bit here, this protrusion, which to me looks like it's bang in the middle. So you think, can I use that as a reference? But if I use that as a reference then it would mean I've got to move it to the left. So I have to go with the banking pins because as far as I can remember, that is how we do it. And it's painful because I've got to take the hairspring off again, try and just move it a fraction and then put it all back together again. And if I've moved it the wrong way, then it's a pain because I've got to do it all over again, move it the opposite way. <laughs> and trust me, I've been here many times before. So I'll, perhaps show you the movement if I can. It's so fine work, it's hard with all the cameras and equipment, but we'll try because perhaps some of you want to learn this yourself. Here we have the uh, balance and hairspring removed and you hopefully can see actually a breguet style uh, hairspring. So it's got this strange curve at the end here and then the terminal curve to the stud. Uh, gives it more sort of accuracy, I suppose, really. Um, now I'm going to cop out and not show the adjustment because I'm on the digital microscope and I don't have a good sense of depth and I need to put a small oiler or something in here and I'm just going to nudge it just a little bit one way and I'm going to do that on my stereoscope because I don't want to go wrong now, chaps. It's been hours in the making and to ruin it now would really drive me crackers. But hopefully some of you will appreciate that. Those who want to get into this hobby, don't start messing with hairsprings until you are confident enough to do so uh, because it ends in tears. And when it ends in tears and you scrap something like this, uh, you'll be gutted. It's all right if you can replace it, 
But some of these old watches, this one's from the 40s. Could I, could I get a new uh, hairspring and balance? Possibly not. Um, so yeah, only when you've got enough experience and you've practiced on some old movements and stuff should you start really attempting things like this. Well, that was attempt number one. Nudged it ever so slightly. And as much as it's tightened the lines, uh, it's gone the wrong way. <laughs> so either I have moved it the wrong way or I moved it too much. It's hard to ascertain. I feel like I'm in for a long night now of nudge here, nudge there, nudge everywhere. So hopefully the next shot you see is it done. And then I'll tell you how many times it took me to do it. <laughs> And here's attempt number two, and we're getting a bit closer, aren't we? I'm not going to be looking for perfection or even 0 0.1, but if we can be 0 point something, I will be happy enough. So I'm going to do the old third time lucky, see what I get. Well, third time lucky indeed, just on a slight bit of regulation as well. And you can see, well, the beta has drastically improved. Um, I could again spend all day tweaking this, but I've kind of given up. There's a part reason why if I put it to stress positions like the crown up, you will see it starts to run away and it does the same on crown down. So those two positions aren't super fantastic. Uh, it does slow down a bit, as you can see now. It's mainly on the crown down where I've seen it. So perhaps there's like a slight poise issue. It's quite difficult to say. And then I'll turn it all the way around, but this will be dial um, up position. And again, you can see that the beta opens up a little bit more. I mean, you have to leave it running for a while really rather than this quick test. But it's an old movement, it's 80 years old. This watch has clearly been very, very well worn and used given the state of the, the case. So someone's treasured it. And to be honest with you, without having to change any pivots or do anything really than just a major clean, um, it's a testament, isn't it, to mechanical uh, movements in general. I'm still fascinated by these things, how they can run 24 seven every day of the week and require so little maintenance. And this one being so small as well, it's just a tiny, tiny movement. And with its history and pedigree, to think that this sort of this watch was rugged enough for military combat uh, during the Second World War. So I'm just going to put it back in the case now, stick the hands and dial back on, and I think I'll show you now the finished watch. And here it is, the finished watch. And you know what? I've really, really enjoyed this one. It hasn't been too challenging. It's been really mucky movement. Everything's seized up, of course, but nothing was broken. Uh, nothing needed replacing, not even the mainspring, actually. Um, had a bit of a challenge trying to get the beat error in, but I think I've revived and breathed life into a very old watch that clearly has been worn to death. It's been through a war, even if it hasn't physically been through a war. So someone treasured this, and uh, it's nice to see it beating again um, I've kept it all as is I don't want to plate this case you want to see a, a plate uh, one of these watches plated well then head off to my friend Chris at CS Spinner channel he does a really good version of this watch I think a few others maybe Marshall's done it as well and I just want to keep it all original even that crown it's really worn but it tells the story of the watch I've put it on this car key uh, NATO strap, I think that works quite well, very appropriate for uh, well, what it stands for. It's a World War II watch. So what does a 30 millimeter watch look like on a seven inch, 18 centimeter wrist? Well, there's your answer. It is quite small, but again, I'm happy to wear small watches. It doesn't bother me at all. And you know, anyone wants to ask you what it is, you can tell them the story, can't you? It's fascinating. Um, yeah, really pleased with this one. May as well give you a couple of movement shots now as well, so you can actually see that running at its full capacity. I think the amplitude is a little bit lower than I would like. Um, and perhaps, I don't know, at a future date, I might service this off camera again, just to try and get it running up to the standards that I like. Uh, I think now as well, I'll just 
put it in front of some of its homage watches, watches that I've actually reviewed uh, on my review channel. Personally, I think nothing beats an original, but to the left, you've got the uh, Precidus uh, Quartz version, which I reviewed, and that is the actual exact copy, really, just being blown up. It's got a, a horrible quartz movement in there, let's face it, but it's got the same dial configuration, so it's nice to see that. And on the right is the Boltony version again. I think that's emulating maybe one of the Elgin ones or something like that. It's, it's got a nice coined edge. And of course, sitting in the middle is the original. And perhaps they should take note and make a smaller watch uh, as a result. So look guys, that is the end of this video. I really do hope you've enjoyed this journey on this one. And of course, if you did, then hit that like button, uh, hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed it and you want to see more like it. And of course, leave comments below. I do read every single one. I try to reply to as many as I can, but I do get a lot. If you want to support the channel, head over to my website, My Retro Watches. There's some affiliate links there for some tools and bits and pieces. And soon I might be selling some watches. So stay tuned for that. And you want to see what I'm getting up to on a more regular basis then head over to my Instagram account, my retro watches, where I post quite often in there the watches I'm wearing or the projects I am working on. So you can find out there before you see it here. Thanks very much. See you in the next video. Bye for now.